All right. Um, thank you for coming out today. Thank you for inviting me to Iceland. It's really an honor to be here. So th this lecture is based on my most recent book, Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change, and the New Geography of Violence. And um, I've always been an academic and a journalist. And for the better part of a decade, I left academia and was just working full time as a journalist reporting on conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. And the idea for Tropic of Chaos came to me while reporting on the opium crop in Afghanistan. And I did several stories about this, separated by a few years. And each time I did the story, I would ask the farmers, why are you growing this crop which is illegal and which causes danger in that the government has an eradication program and you know, you're, you're taking these risks, so why do you do this? And part of the answer always included because poppy is very drought resistant. And poppy, from poppy comes opium, from opium comes heroin. Afghanistan produces over 90% of the world's heroin. And so they say, yeah, well, poppy is very drought resistant. And it's in fact five to six times more drought resistant than a lot of the traditional crops like wheat or orchard crops and uh, vine crops. And I didn't even realize that there was a major drought going on in Afghanistan. And indeed, there has been a, the worst drought in living memory has coincided with most of the NATO occupation in Afghanistan. And the farmers would say, well, this is really the only crop under these conditions that we can grow and make enough money to feed our families. And this played into the logic of the war in that in this conflict, there were two positions on poppy. There was the government supported by NATO, which was eradicating poppy. Frequently, it wasn't actually eradicating poppy, but, but it was sending out police who would then shake down farmers for bribes in the name of eradication. And the other side of the conflict, the Taliban were supporting the farmer's right to grow poppy. They would tax the poppy crop, but they supported the farmer's right to grow poppy. And they would say, you know, in exchange for protecting your crops and protecting you, you know, we expect you to shelter our wounded, to hide weapons for us, to, uh, you know, support us with a, a son maybe who could fight. And I realized, okay, so even in this conflict, which has deep roots in the great game and uh, more recently, the great game being the struggle between Tsarist Russia and um, British imperialism in the Indian subcontinent, and more recently in the Cold War, all these you know, historical causes to the war in Afghanistan, even this war has an environmental angle, a climatological angle, and that one of the reasons that the Taliban have an endless line of recruits is because there's an environmental crisis, and this crop, the poppy crop, is a solution, and they are supporting that crop. So I figured that there must be environmental angles to many conflicts around the world. And so the book explores those conflicts, beginning in East Africa, in Kenya, continuing on through uh, Central Asia to Latin America, to the, to the, the, the US and the Mexico border. And what I found in all of these situations were uh, a set of variables that climate change rarely, if ever, acts alone or in isolation to create violence. But rather, it creates violence by interacting with two previously existing crises. And those are, namely, the legacy of Cold War militarism, which has littered much of the global south with cheap weaponry and men, I use that word advisedly, uh, primarily it is men, trained in the arts of asymmetrical warfare, either as guerrillas or as counterinsurgent police and military forces, the Cold War ends, the great ideological battle evaporates, but those weapons are around and those people with those skills still remain. So that's sort of one crisis. Much of the global south, many developing economies are littered with cheap weapons and people who know how to fight wars. The other pre-existing crisis that climate change interacts with is the crises created by neoliberal economic restructuring. That is to say, the free market restructuring of developing economies in the global south that has been pushed for the last 30 years by the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, um, in the name of economic efficiency and rectitude. 
country after country have been offered lifeline loans, bailouts in exchange for liberalizing their economies, privatizing state assets, removing capital controls on investment, cutting subsidies to farmers, cutting subsidies for public health and education, and essentially reducing the state, which in some of these countries was never very robust, but reducing the state to a shadow of its former self. So that when climate change enters the scene in the form of extreme weather, droughts punctuated by flooding, people turn to the state and find that there's no assistance for them. So the book opens with uh, the case of a, a, a Turkana pastoralist in Kenya who had just been killed in a cattle raid. And the Turkana region of, of Kenya is suffering major drought. All of Kenya, interestingly, has had increased precipitation over the last 30 years, but it comes all at once, so that the general experience is one of drought, even though there's actually more water falling on the country. And the state in, in this north northwestern corner of Kenya is, um, really has nothing to offer farmers and pastoralists. There is a fairly robust anti-famine uh, program, but beyond that, there's not that much. So in the face of this drought, these pastoralists can't get any support from the government, so they have to adapt to climate change somehow, and they do that by picking up the cheap weaponry of the Cold War. And right next door is Somalia. Somalia co collapsed because it was a frontline state during the Cold War. Long story short on that is that there is a a, a revolution in Somalia in 1969. Uh, a socialist, Said Bari, comes to power. Uh, a few years later, there's a revolution, another socialist revolution next door in Ethiopia. These two nominally socialist countries go to war against each other because Said Bari in Somalia is really more than anything. He's a Somali irredentist nationalist and he wants to take the Ogden region. This is a war that's still going on. This sort of like, um, you see where Ethiopia juts into Somalia. That's the Ogden region, that kind of um, salinate, that triangle there. And at one point, the, the, the Cubans, the Cubans have essentially, at this point, into the, the uh, mid-'70s, have dragged the Soviet Union into Africa because Cuba wanted to create a swarming of small socialist states. So there are actually Cuban and Russian advisors on both sides for a moment. Then Said Bari figures this out, and he switches sides all at once, and then the U.S. starts supporting Somalia. Uh, the Carter regime, with the best of intentions, thinking that they're fighting totalitarian communism, gets money from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, and they start pouring weaponry and aid into the Somali side. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union and Cuba, also with the best of intentions, thinking they're building a better society, freeing the developing world from the yoke of capitalist imperialism, are pouring weaponry into the Ethiopian side. Long story short, this culminates in the collapse of Somalia along clan lines. The army disintegrates in the uh, latter part of 1990. By 1991, it's a failed state. Huge amounts of weapons pulse out of Somalia into Kenya. So now, when herders like Ekru Lorman are facing drought and the state has nothing for them, their animals are dying, they can't get medicine, they, they, the state won't help them by drilling wells to, to get temporary water. What there are are cheap weapons, and so they pick up these weapons and they go against their neighbors who are in turn coming after their cattle. And so the traditional cattle raiding has really ramped up into something like an ongoing civil war in the pastoralist corridor of East Africa. So I call this interaction of of forces, right? Climate change interacting with the legacy of neoliberal economic restructuring and Cold War militarism, the catastrophic convergence. And this catastrophic convergence plays out differently in different places. It's not always one part the legacy of militarism, one part neoliberal restructuring, and one part climate change. In some places, the balance is quite different. So in Afghanistan, there was never really any economic restructuring, but there was the trauma of the Cold War. In India, um, there's a war that has increasingly taken on climatological angles. If you sort of the, um, the eastern side of India, there's a, a guerrilla movement called the Naxalites, which begins in the late 60s, and it's a Maoist organization, and for much of its history, it was isolated in the northeast of India. 
But increasingly, there's been severe drought in India. And this has coincided also with the liberalization of the um, sort of semi-socialist um, political economy of, of India. So as the drought kicks in, you can, you can actually track district by district down along the eastern Ghats, which are the, uh, the mountain range on the eastern side of India. District by district where there's extreme drought, the Naxalites follow. And again, it's this process of farmers suffering. They turn to the government for assistance, and there's little or nothing there. The, uh, the old agricultural, state-owned agricultural banks have been privatized. There's very little agrarian extension for these farmers. They have, due to globalization and liberalization, increasingly taken to growing GMO-modified cotton, which at first is very productive, but then strips the soil out. It also needs uh, expensive inputs like pesticide and fertilizers. The state isn't there to offer free credit, so the farmers turn to money lenders. The money lenders won't advance money for food crops for fear that the farmers will steal the collateral, i.e. eat in an emergency the crop which the money lender has a right to because they've advanced the credit for it. So the money lenders exacerbate this problem by only extending credit for cotton. So the more desperate the situation becomes, the more cotton is grown. The more cotton is grown, the deeper into debt the farmers go, the worse the environmental crisis. And across India, as I'm sure many of you know, over 200,000 farmers have committed suicide due to these conditions. In uh, Andhra Pradesh, in the part of Andhra Pradesh, which is now called Telangana, the northern part of it, where I was doing this research, 2,000 farmers had killed themselves, often by drinking the poison, the pesticides for the cotton. So you can imagine, if you're a farmer about to commit suicide by drinking poison, and the Naxalites show up in your village and they say, hey, we've got a solution. We've got a long-term and a short-term solution to your problems. The short-term solution is when the money lender comes back, we stop his car, we pull him out, and we blow his brains out on the road, and he won't come back. And then when the cops come to investigate, we'll ambush them. That's the short-term solution. You support us, and we will get these parasites out of here for you. The long-term solution, which the farmers may or may not buy into that much, is we're going to create a Maoist socialist utopia here in India. So if you're on the verge, you're a young farmer, you're on the verge of committing suicide, why not wait a bit and commit political homicide instead? And so the drought and the Naxalite rebellion move together. In Mexico, and there are many examples, I won't go into all these, but in, in Mexico, you know, there's really not much of a Cold War legacy. Similarly in India, there wasn't much, you know, a Cold War struggle there, but in Mexico, there was very little Cold War militarism. There was a, a bit of a guerrilla movement in, in Oaxaca in the 70s. But you have really intense drug violence in the north of Mexico. And this has a climatological angle. I was in Juarez, and I met a fisherman, a former fisherman, who was sitting on the south bank of the Rio Grande, looking north into the US. And he was very distraught. And I was talking with him, and his situation was the following, that he had been a fisherman in the southern part of Mexico. He'd had a small boat, and he had done quite well until there was a red tide, an algae bloom. And this was caused in part by the liberalization of the Mexican economy, which allowed pretty much every mangrove swamp to be, swamp to be turned into a, um, um, a shrimp farm or paved over and you know, turned into hotels, et cetera, et cetera. So there's less capacity for cleaning the water. The desperation of the last 20 years in Mexico of trying to export their way out of perpetual crisis meant there's intensive chemical agriculture. A lot of that runs off. The waters are warmer due to climate change. So you get these uh, excess um, fertilizer flowing into the sea with warm waters. You get these algal blooms, red tides. And so that wiped this guy out. There was sort of two years of, uh, during an El Nino where he couldn't, he couldn't make it. He turns to the state. The state is not there anymore, by and large. Mexico had been um, a kind of mixed economy. It had what was considered the first socialist constitution in the world. The constitution of 1919, after the Mexican Revolution, had uh, Article 27, which said that everything in Mexico belongs to the state. 
that private property can exist but only at the pleasure of the state. And Article 27 enumerated everything down to the rock salt. Like everything in Mexico belongs to the state. And if the state decides that you can't use it privately, that's it. It also created the ajito system. The, the Mexican Revolution created a system of land tenureship for villages which made the land holdings uh, unalienable. You could not use land as collateral. So the ajito system w was a huge support system for the peasants of Mexico. There's a, in the debt crisis of the 1980s, which is a whole other story, which I'll get into in a, a different lecture, um, forces Mexico, Mexico is on the verge of defaulting on its debts. It's gonna, there's gonna be economic chaos and crisis if that happens. It's offered a bailout loan from the US in exchange for continued beginning and then continued liberalization, culminating in rewriting the Constitution, scrapping Article 27, and this paves the way to the North American Free Trade Agreement. So during the, the, uh, the sort of developmentalist heyday of Mexico from the 30s when oil is nationalized through the 70s, there were a lot of parastate corporations. There were major fish packing corporations and marketing corporations that were state-owned, partially state-owned, they had price controls, and what it meant was that small fishermen could survive through tough times because they weren't exposed to all the violence and vagaries of the market. There was this kind of semi-socialist cushion. Now, there were tons of problems with this. These were corrupt organizations, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not, not trying to paint an uh, overly rosy picture of the Mexican public sector, but as part of this neoliberal economic restructuring, all that is removed. And so this guy was on his own. When, when he lost his skiff, there was no assistance to help him uh, rebuild his, his capital and continue his life way. So he migrates first to northern Mexico, then to the US, where he works as a roofer for a number of years. He's not documented. He's undocumented migrant worker. He's eventually arrested and deported. And when I meet him, he's in Juarez, sitting there looking back at the US and he says, my old boss has called me on my cell phone and um, he said I can have my job back in Las Cruces, New Mexico if I can get back there. And, and the US border has been thoroughly militarized. Don't let the comments of Donald Trump about building a wall uh, fool you. There is a wall on the Mexican border. There's also enormous deployments of National Guard and Border Patrol. There is what would be uh, the second largest air force in the world. The, the Border Patrol has an enor enormous number of planes. If it were its own army, it would, it would be about the second or third largest air force in the world by number of planes. Um, so he, he can't get across the border that easily. And he's like, he says, you know, it cost me about $3,000 to get across the border. And the only way I can get that money is if I get involved in the drug trade here in Juarez. And in Juarez, there is a, a massive and violent drug trade underway. Um, there's a kind of state failure in northern Mexico. And so he was contemplating, you know, picking up work, doing whatever kind of, you know, currying drugs or wiping someone out. You could easily make some money by killing someone in Juarez. The, the clearance rate for crimes, at least when I was researching this, was about 2% or less. So that means if you kill somebody in Juarez, you have basically a 98% chance of getting away with it. And so there you can see like, okay, you can't reduce that violence to climate change, but also it's, there's clearly a, a growing environmental angle to this crisis of violence in northern Mexico, which has its roots in primarily in other things, primarily in the economic restructuring, et cetera, et cetera. Across the border in the US, there's a different kind of climate violence developing in response to all of this, border militarization, increased policing, increased surveillance, and this has been going on since the 1990s, and uh, now we see a similar process in Europe. Frontex has really built up its forces in the Mediterranean in response to the, um, the refugee crisis, the people fleeing Libya and Syria and Iraq. And in the global north, climate violence takes that form of increasingly xenophobic politics, state hardening, expansion of the internal police state, militarization of borders. So 
that is, um, you know, that, that is how climate violence plays out as I see it in both the global south and in the global north. Um, it's a pretty depressing story, but um, that, is, that is the situation. And, and why I did this was, why I wrote this book and provided this thesis was because I felt that many progressives in the US, many on the left, were in denial about state failure and in denial about the crisis of state collapse in the global south. And the right, on the other hand, was using this and publicizing it and using it to justify further militarism. And I felt that it was not sufficient to just deny this crisis, but there had to be a progressive explanation for what its real roots were so that we could address the root causes. So that's what Tropic of Chaos is all about.